There's some interesting leaks, announcements, and articles coming out recently suggesting that the U.S. is being very, very careful with how to respond to the three American soldiers that were killed in Jordan last week. We've got a new study from The Guardian using satellite imagery showing the level of destruction that has taken place across Gaza since the war began. And a new poll shows that more Americans believe that Israeli civilians are facing the genocide than Palestinian civilians. So let's get into it. I'm recording this at 9 a.m. Central on Friday, February 2nd, 2024. So we still haven't yet seen a U.S. military response to the death of three of our soldiers, the killing of three of our soldiers in Jordan earlier this week. Every day I wake up, I think there's going to be news about that. There hasn't been. Instead, we're getting some interesting leaks, announcements, and some articles that I'll run through here. Now, this kind of action takes time. It is unrealistic to think that a significant strike, coordinated strike, accurate strike could take place within hours of that attack in Jordan. Uh, you know, when we had a lot of troops, 100 plus thousand troops in Iraq, on or around 90,000 troops in Afghanistan, if this same type of thing took place then, we would have the capability in that country to carry out strikes a little faster, just more targeting resources on the ground, more assets overhead, ready and able to carry out those actions. It's a very different operating environment right now, even though we do have troops uh, in Jordan, in Syria, and in Iraq. It's nowhere near what we had at one point and the targeting infrastructure, strike infrastructure we had kind of at the peak of that war. So you have to expect it to take time. We have kind of crossed that threshold to where it's a little surprising something hasn't happened yet. But what we're getting instead of U.S. military action, which I do still think is coming, are some interesting kind of announcements. So we got a report that the IRGC is starting to leave Syria out of nowhere. Right, kind of surprising. Now, there's a, a couple aspects to that. Uh, one of them we'll get into here in a second is Israel continues to carry out strikes against IRGC officials in Syria, so they're coming under increasing pressure uh, militarily. There's also the concern that the U.S. might actually target some of those members here in the near future. So all of a sudden, public knowledge, IRGC is leaving Syria to a degree. There's still some staying behind, of course. Uh, we've got reports coming out in multiple articles talking about how Iran doesn't really want war with the United States. They do not want to fight the United States. Not a surprise. The U.S. doesn't really, for the most part, doesn't really want to fight Iran either. Uh, interesting timing for that one as we're kind of lining up what this response would be. And then there was an article yesterday in the New York Times, out of nowhere, kind of, talking about how Iran has slowed their production of enriched uranium, which is good news. That's a, posit that's a step in the right direction. But you, you have to consider the timing of that, right? This is in this very small window where the U.S. is considering what and how to respond to these strikes that killed American soldiers by a group likely uh, heavily connected to Iran. Uh, additionally, there's been a lot of messaging and signaling about when these strikes are going to occur and what they're going to look like. Uh, a U.S. official told CBS News that plans had been approved for a series of strikes over a number of days against targets, including Iranian personnel and facilities inside of Iraq and Syria. It's, this is a lot. It's, it's a lot of, even, even if Iran knows that, even if these proxy forces know that, to just put this out in the public and say, yeah, what we're going to do is, here's our plan. We're going to hit Iranian personnel, potentially, inside of Iraq and Syria. And this comes at the same time, again, that Iran says that they're pulling some of their forces out of Syria, how they don't want war, and how, hey, remember that nuclear issue? We're slowing down our production. It's just, it's a lot in a very short period of time for this stuff to be coming out, Um it does seem like a personal opinion. It seems like the current stance of the U.S. government is is so averse to any risk of escalation that we're, we're not striking some of these adversaries as much as we could to lead to some sort of deterrence. Again, that's a personal opinion, but we'll see if these carry out, uh, what these look like, if they're against Kataib Hezbollah, uh, um, against any of these other Iranian-backed militias, or against Iranian targets themselves in Iraq or Syria, but it's a lot, a lot of messaging right now ahead of a strike campaign. Now, in line with that, uh, if you remember a couple days ago, Kataib Hezbollah, one of the largest and most well-funded Iranian-backed militias in the region, said they were going to shift to a defensive posture. They said, we're going to you know, tap out here. They may have been responsible for the attack in Jordan. That still has not yet been confirmed. If you look at any of the official reports, they say Iranian-backed groups or Islamic resistance in Iraq. That includes all of these different militias. Kataib Hezbollah is one of the uh, primary suspects, I would say, just the nature of what they've done in the past. So they put out a statement saying, actually, 
we're going to stop because we don't want to embarrass the Iraqi government. We're just going to stop. No more attacking American forces. We're going to sit this out. Again, I don't think that's going to preclude them from uh, being on the receiving end of American strikes here before too long. But another major group in the region said, good for you, not us. We're going to continue fighting. Uh, Hakarat Hezbollah al-Nujaba, another major Iranian-backed group in the region, said that their group will continue to fight uh, against U.S. forces until the war in Gaza stops and the U.S. withdraws from Iraq. Interesting, right? We're seeing more of these little rifts in these militia groups. Uh, something notable was when Kataib Hezbollah put their statement out, they said, Iran has no idea what we're doing. We're just out here doing our own thing. We're fighting our own fight uh, for our own interests. Again, part of the messaging piece here, ahead of what is believed to be U.S. strikes against a handful of these uh, groups across the region. And this kind of highlights it. Kataib Hezbollah saying, we're going to back out. We're just not going to fight the Americans head on anymore for now. And then Hakarat Hezbollah al Najaba saying, good for you. We're still going to. There's a definite rift emerging right now between some of these key components of the Islamic resistance in Iraq, and it's 100% worth keeping an eye on. Now, while the U.S. continues to uh, over-message in terms of what's coming, uh, in terms of strikes across the region, uh, Israel's kind of doing the opposite. They're not really saying anything at all. They just continue to kill Iranian IRGC leaders in Syria. The strikes in Syria have increased as of late, and it's notable. So uh, just yesterday, we got news from an Iranian news site that said an IRGC member was killed in Israeli strikes, alleged Israeli strikes south of Damascus, uh, and that the Iranian and that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard have scaled back deployments of their senior officers in Syria due to a spate of deadly Israeli strikes and will rely more on allied Shiite militias to preserve their influence in the region. Again, we've seen a lot just since October 7th, of Israeli strikes targeting key IRGC personnel. They say since December, Israeli strikes have killed more than half a dozen IRGC members, including one of the Guard's top intelligence generals. Uh, they quoted a senior regional security official here. This is in a piece by Reuters. They said senior Iranian commanders had left Syria, along with dozens of mid-ranking officers, describing it as a, quote, downsizing of their presence. Look, these IRGC leaders aren't getting killed in, in Iran. Uh, it's, it's for the most part right now just in Syria. We'll see if, if some of them start getting hit in Iraq as well, but they're kind of moving back a little bit is the term. Essentially, Israel has, has successfully moved Iran to a degree to, to reduce their presence in Syria. That's significant if you think about it. Um, that's a major step in a lot of ways, and Israel was able to, to accomplish that uh, through just a handful of strikes against senior IRGC officials. Uh, at the same time, fortunately, those strikes have not led to a broader escalation of the war. You could say that that, that Israel striking inside of Syria is an escalation in its own. Got it. Uh, but it, it appears at this point that those Israeli actions have not led to a direct Iranian response of any sorts. Now, turning down to the Houthis in Yemen, U.S. Central Command yesterday said that uh, their forces engaged and shot down one UAV over the Gulf of Aden, and then conducted a series of strikes and destroyed an Iranian-backed Houthi explosive uncrewed surface vessel in the Red Sea, which resulted in significant secondary explosions. I uh, believe this is the second USV that has been uh, identified. I think the first one was tested and detonated. I don't know that the first one was actually intercepted. Either way, adds to the arsenal here, right? So now the Houthis have clearly drones, anti-ship ballistic missiles, and now we're starting to see uh, the use of these uncrewed service vessels. So uh, the risks, the threats continue to increase in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. Additionally, U.S. Central Command said that two anti-ship ballistic missiles were launched from Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen towards the MV Khoi in the Red Sea. They said the missiles impacted in the water without hitting the ship. There were no injuries and no damage reported, adding that the MV Khoi is a Liberian-flagged, Bermuda-owned cargo ship. I think yesterday it was reported that it was owned by a U.K. company. Either way, uh, Bermuda, UK, Liberia, all these shipping companies, they got such complex ownership structures. What we're seeing, and there were some articles that came out recently talking to this, how there's not really been a decrease in attacks. If you go day by day, you might be able to say, hey, good news, there wasn't an attack yesterday, or there were only five, and I'm making these numbers up top of head, there were only five attacks last week instead of 12. The fact is these attacks aren't stopping. Every so often, you might be able to find a slight decrease, but the Houthis have pretty successfully at this point maintained a constant pace of attacks into the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. In turn, there's no sign the international shipping is going to return to their pre-November levels when this all kicked off really anytime soon. 
Then we've got a pretty interesting study put together here by The Guardian using satellite imagery, and they get into their methods at, at the very end of this piece here. What they did was they took satellite imagery from before the war and during to show the destruction that's taken place in Gaza so far. The red markings here on this map are damaged buildings. And they say through this investigation, they found damage to more than 250 residential buildings, 17 schools and universities, 16 mosques, three hospitals, three cemeteries, and 150 agricultural greenhouses. They say entire buildings have been leveled, fields flattened, and places of worship wiped off the map in the course of Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza. Now, they did get statements from uh, Israel on this as well. So according to the IDF, they said, quote, Hamas operates nearby, underneath, and within densely populated areas as a matter of routine operational practice. As a part of the IDF's operations, it has been carrying out strikes on military targets, as well as locating and destroying infrastructure when imp Im imperatively required to achieve the goals of the war. Now, through this study, and I'll kind of bounce around through a couple different pictures here, uh, they said the City University of New York showed that between 50 and 62% of all buildings in Gaza had been damaged or destroyed, as a, which it sounds like a lot at baseline, right? Uh, half or more of the entire Gaza Strip damage, it's significant. As a comparison, because a lot of people look at different historical battles to say, well, it's not this bad or it is that bad. Using data from between 2000, 2013 and 2016, UN data showed that 40% of Aleppo structures were damaged during the Syrian civil war. So 40% of Aleppo structures damaged over a three-year period of time during the Syrian civil war, as many as 62% of structures in Gaza damaged in, what are we at now, uh, barely four months, really? It's just, it's been very, very intense in Gaza from, from the get-go of this war. Now, the way they put this together is they said satellite imagery had been sourced from Planet Labs. Images prior to the 2023 conflict were taken in May 2023, while the damage evidence presented is from images taken on 30 November and 31 December 2023 and 5 January 2024. They said an area was only confirmed as damaged if two or more reporters on the ground managed to verify it. So there's one piece here that I think would be interesting to kind of provide the full uh picture of what's happening in Gaza is if, and we're not going to get this for a while because it's an ongoing war and this would be sensitive military data, but if we could get an overlay of IDF targeting, right, to see what they targeted and where, where they had identified um, tunnel openings, uh, fighting positions, rocket launch points, et cetera, et cetera, that Hamas was using or Palestinian Islamic Jihad to see how that overlays with what we're now seeing in terms of the destruction of Gaza. But either way, I'll put a link in the description below to this study. I think it's really interesting. And there's there's so much data here that I think it's really worth kind of spending your time to scroll through and, and get an idea, quite frankly, of, of what Gaza is looking like now four months into this war. Then turning to operations on the ground, Hamas said over the course of the past 72 hours, the Qassam Mujahideen, their militant arm, were able to completely or partially destroy 41 Israeli military vehicles, confirming that 25 Israeli soldiers were killed and dozens injured. Again, this, this is the Hamas statement of what happened on the ground. They said the Israeli forces were targeted with missiles, anti-fortification devices, and individuals clashing with them from a distance of zero, as in very close-range engagements. We're hearing that from the Israeli side as well. Uh, they also said they targeted Israeli rescue teams, Two tunnels and a house were booby-trapped and blown up. We've talked about this multiple times. One of the challenges that Israel is and continues to face throughout this fight is that the houses that are rigged with explosives, the tunnel entrances that detonate, or the booby traps inside of the tunnels, or what we're seeing more and more now, Hamas militants engaging in small arms fire, direct combat with Israeli forces inside of the tunnel networks underground. Uh, we're hearing that now from both sides. Uh, additionally, they say that Hamas was able to destroy the headquarters, field command rooms, and military concentrations with mortar shells and short-range missiles in all of the fighting fronts of the Gaza Strip and rained a missile on the city of Tel Aviv. Then Israel says that they were able to eliminate more than 20 Hamas militants over the course of the last day, most of them also at close range, as they continued operations through Khan Yunus in the southern portion of the Gaza Strip. So again, we're starting to see more and more from both sides at this point, talking not just about the, the continued combat on the ground, but more and more of it is, is coming at close range. And I think a lot of this has to do with as Israel moves further into southern Gaza in and around Khan Yunus, they're kind of collapsing the available Hamas positions to where they get down below ground and they start clearing out these tunnels. They're running into more and more situations where Hamas is still occupying those tunnels and carries out attacks underground. 
Then there was an interesting poll that just came out I wanted to run through where it showed that more Americans believe that Israeli civilians are facing a genocide than Palestinian civilians. And there were a couple other data points in here that I thought were interesting and worth bringing up. Just, again, a lot of these polls line up with kind of you hear them across multiple media outlets. Those ones aren't as interesting to me. It's more interesting when it's a little bit different than what you might normally hear. So be cautious with that. That doesn't mean that the one thing that is different is right. It's just the kind of thing it catches my attention, and I feel like it's worth bringing up uh, to talk through and get a, get an idea. Let me know. Let me know what you think here. So this was a YouGov Economist poll conducted between January 28th and January 30th. They talked with 1,686 U.S. adult citizens. And a couple questions here. They said, do you personally make a distinction between Hamas and the Palestinian people or not? 44% said make a distinction. 23% said they do not. And 32% said they don't know. What you'll see throughout a lot of these is each one of the questions I'm going to run through is 30% or more say don't know. I like that. Good for you. Like, that's my favorite part of any of these polls. When people are like, I'm not going to be forced into answering a question that I don't have enough information about or I don't feel confident in answering. Love it. I'm glad those numbers are high. Um, I feel like one of the challenges in a lot of polls is where your option is A or B and you don't know what you're doing, so you just make a choice. So anyways, 32% said they don't know, uh, but, but almost double said they do make a distinction. 44% to 23%. I think that's positive. Um, personal opinion there. I think at the beginning of this war, there was as, as people were hearing Hamas for the first time in a lot of ways, I think there was a lot of confusion there and a lot of people were conflating the two. And I, I, I think it's a positive I think it's positive in this sense to be able to separate, you know, the people from the organization. And it looks like we're trending in that direction more than we were at the beginning of the war. Then they asked, is Israel committing a genocide against Palestinian civilians? 31% said yes, 34% said no, 35% said not sure. Pretty split across the board, like very close to one third for each one of those. Again, 35% not sure, good on you. Um, then you can move to the yes and no's, a little less than 50% say yes. This is one where it gets worded a lot of different ways in a lot of different polls. 50% is probably the low side that I've seen around yes. So this, if you, I think it's a 3% error listed here. So that would put it within the air, you know, um, about right. I've seen it a little bit higher at times. A lot of times when you see that number thrown up in the 70 to 80%, they're including things like the not sure. Like, I don't think it would be fair in either one of these to roll that not sure into the yes or into the no. I think it's best to just exclude it entirely. So anyways, is Israel committing a genocide against Palestinian civilians? 31% yes, 34% no. Is Hamas committing a genocide against Israeli civilians? 52% yes, 17% no, 31% not sure. So again, about one third uh, sitting this one out, not sure. But a, a quite a few more, 52% to 17% say that Hamas is committing a genocide against Israeli civilians. I thought it was interesting that they put these two questions side by side. In most of the conversation I see today uh, across most media outlets, and I think this probably has to do with the case that's been, that it's currently in front of the ICJ around the accusation that Israel's committing a genocide. All of the focus is on that. All of the focus is on Israel committing acts against the Palestinian people. So I thought it was interesting here that they bring Hamas into that question as well. Say, well, how do you feel about Israel and what they're doing in, in, in Gaza? Also, how do you feel about Hamas and what they're doing to the Israeli people? So again, um, I'm not sure, like with any poll, you can find any data you want to support anything you want to say. So I don't want to throw this out there as 100% absolute fact. It's a, a poll of 1,600 Americans. Thought it was worth bringing up. Let me know what you think. That's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in national security subjects, be sure to check out my Substack that I've got linked in the description below. Uh, we've just started to bring some people on board, putting out more in-depth articles that really supplement the topics I'm talking about in these videos, and they're free. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of value. Of course, if you're interested in that, check them out at the link in the description below. But thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.